Pearson Hill is looking for salamander eggs. First, he'll have to clear out his workspace. That's what they, this is what they generally do. They just coil and flip their heads open. And he can't even see. His eyes are just facing almost directly down the ground. But yeah, I'm just going to kind of stick him over there. So I don't have to worry about him at all while we're playing with salamander eggs. Specifically, frosted flatwood salamanders. 150 years ago, they were probably in hundreds of wetlands out here, and there was hundreds of thousands of them. So now, oh, I just got eggs. Here in the Apalachicola National Forest is one of the last strongholds for this increasingly rare salamander. This could also be where the species starts to make a resurgence. It's winter in the forest near Sumatra. Wildflowers have gone to seed. A mother green lynx spider has changed her color to match her surroundings and better protect her young. And frosted flatwood salamanders have been breeding in ephemeral wetlands. What does their total population look like right now? There's really only two areas where flatwood salamanders still occur and that's St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge and here on the Apalachicola National Forest. I can't say how many are left at St. Mark's, but there may be, you know, a thousand to five thousand there. On the Apalachicola National Forest, it's almost certainly less than 500 adults, maybe down to 100 adults. And um, so, yeah, if you do the math there, the adult population size is critically low. I consider them to be functionally extinct out here, which means they're no longer, you know, filling their niche. They, um, even where they occur, they occur in such low densities that they just are there nominally. Um, I would say there's three breeding populations out here that are moderately robust. Everything else is just, you know, on the verge of extinction. Pearson is out here looking for eggs to take back and raise in a safe environment. When we're searching for eggs, we basically crawl around on our hands and knees all day, just meticulously peeling back the leaves of these plants and looking um, in between them and underneath them for these little gaps. We use a headlamp to kind of cut shadows and be able to see down into the crevices and mouths of crayfish burrows. We target kind of the fluffiest areas of these fire-maintained herb and grass communities. And so where all these plants are kind of jammed up together and form kind of this fluffy, poofy structure, that's the most likely area you're going to find a cluster of eggs. Yeah, it's just a matter of being fairly thorough and kind of deflecting the leaves back in, in all different directions. And all of a sudden, these little pockets will show themselves and then there'll be eggs tucked down underneath. And there they are. <laughs> it's in all their glory. You can't see them very well right now because enough debris has fallen on them to kind of obscure them. Once we get them back to the lab, we'll clean them up so we can get a good count on them and see what embryonic stage they're in. And we'll get them nice and hydrated. We collect moist soil from the ponds and we line these sweater boxes. And then we regularly record their numbers and developmental stage. And so once they reach certain uh, range of developmental stages, then we decide that they're ready to hatch. Once the eggs hatch, the larvae are placed in small, enclosed recreations of their habitat called mesocosms. The whole premise of head starting is to basically increase the survivorship at the most vulnerable life stage yes. of the organism. So for uh, flatwood salamanders and most amphibians, that's when they're larva tadpoles. Mm -hmm. Larva hatch December through January, mm -hmm. and they hatch and in response to being inundated by rising water levels. And so in the wild, you know, as the rains fill the ponds up, they hatch incrementally. Here, we have the luxury, we can just plop the eggs in the water and they hatch instantly. Just add water. We'll start hatching probably next week and that'll go through beginning of January. We'll get everything stocked up in here. And then the larva spend January, February, and then get to late March, early April before they transform and become terrestrial. It's now spring in the forest near Sumatra. Orchids and carnivorous plants are blooming. Winter rains have hydrated wetlands. 
these are conditions favorable for releasing the salamander larvae. And yet, there's been a change of plans. Normally, we are able to pull out uh, over a thousand eggs from the wild um, for head starting purposes and to release back. This year, the weather patterns, the rainfall patterns were crazy. They were the exact opposite of what flatwood salamanders need to have a successful nesting and larval season. Typically, they need a dry fall that transitions into a wet winter. This year was a really wet fall. The ponds were overflowing when the salamanders came in to breed, and so they laid their eggs in these really high, weird places where we had a lot of trouble finding them. So normally when we find 1,500 eggs, we only found about 300 this year. And then we had some issues with contaminated equipment that killed some salamanders as well. And so we're down to about 100 salamanders in this whole mesocosm array right now. And so um, it's been kind of collectively decided that the best use for them, um, rather than going back into the wild, is for them to be distributed to uh, various partner zoos for them to attempt captive reproduction. The challenge facing the frosted flatwood salamander is more than one erratic season of rain. Ultimately what is kind of throwing a wrench in all our efforts are the increasing erratic nature of our winter rainfall patterns. So climate change is, is kind of superseding all our other um, conservation efforts, be that habitat restoration, head starting, etc. Yeah, hopefully there'll be captive bred salamanders in the future to release instead of relying on, on wild collected material. Three, four, five, six. This segment was co-produced with Danny Davis. Awesome. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas.